Hey guys, as most of you probably know by now, Origin PC has been a proud sponsor of the show for a while, and I wanted to take some time to call them out and show off a computer that they sent me. Now this computer is part of their Millennium Desktop series and sports one of their newer cases, the Corsair 5000X. Inside this bad boy, we have a 16 core AMD Ryzen 5950X processor, which has 32 threads and boots clock speeds up to 4.9 gigahertz with 72 megabytes of cache. Along with that, we've got the AMD Radeon 6800 XT graphics card, which will allow you to play games at super high frame rates and enable 4K gameplay. Being that we're using these two AMD products in the computer, the computer can take advantage of the shared PCIe 4.0 capability and AMD smart access memory, which optimizes the computer's performance. When it comes to performance, Origin PC allows you to customize the build of your computer so you can pick and choose the hardware that goes in based on your computing needs. Once you order your computer, you can feel safe knowing that Origin PC offers world-class tech support that is available 24-7 via phone or online. So if you wanna check out the offerings that Origin PC has for you guys, click the link in the box down below. And once again, a big thank you to Origin PC for sponsoring today's video and beyond. Thanks for watching, back to the show. The Resident Evil franchise has never stayed in one form for very long. Ever since its inception in 1996, the series has exhibited major changes with each entry, reflecting the very mutating bioweapons that serve as its primary antagonists. What began as zombie-infested haunted houses with conscientious camera choices eventually morphed into unapologetically exaggerated third-person shooters before finally molting into its most modern form that of the claustrophobic first-person escape room. This perpetual change makes a lot of sense, seeing as how stagnation, even for a franchise as storied and revered as Resident Evil, can lead to death. So RE's continued success can be attributed in some part to its willingness to constantly try new things, offering several different flavors of content to its players in any given title. But there is such a thing as too many flavors in one dish. And with this latest entry in the series, Resident Evil may have finally transformed into something with so many different, disconnected elements within it that its overall quality has turned out somewhat bland. To clarify, this latest game does absolutely have its own sense of identity. However, having now completed it, by finishing several playthroughs and grinding through its many challenges, that identity appears to be the one that could have been the greatest of all time. My name's Gerard, and this is what it's like to complete Resident Evil 8, or better known as Resident Evil Village. Yes! All glory goes to the winner! Hello, and welcome to The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. You know, we've been really lucky that Capcom has been pumping out a ton of different Resident Evil titles in recent years. And when I say different, I mean different. We've gotten everything from modern updates to the series' earliest years, to full-on multiplayer Resident Evil, for better or for worse. And now, we also finally have Resident Evil 8, or Village, which means that we've skipped a few RE titles here on the show, and we will get to those eventually, but I just couldn't wait to cover this one. This is the direct sequel to Resident Evil 7, which sounds obvious, I know, but this game was never guaranteed. Resident Evil 7 struck out into unknown territory in a few different ways, and all that new stuff that it brought to the table could have always been intended as one-time experiments by Capcom, regardless of how well they were received. Ethan Winters' story could have ended at the Baker Estate in Resident Evil 7. But as it turns out, Resident Evil 8 solidifies that we are indeed living in a new era of Resident Evil. This is the game that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the first person perspective is now an established element in Resident Evil's repertoire. 
And it confirms that Ethan Winters, the faceless protagonist from Resident Evil 7, is not just a one-hit wonder. But this time, instead of searching for his lady friend Mia, he's now hunting down his baby daughter Rose. Of course, that's after Mia is shot dead, and Rose is abducted by some troops led by Chris Redfield, of all people. The transport carrying them all somehow crashes up, and when Ethan comes to, the only tracks he finds lead him to a creepy remote European village. So of course the guy that single-handedly took on the mutated Backwoods family from hell will have no problems facing an unforgiving landscape, arcane puzzles, and an army of monsters in order to protect his child armed only with a few firearms. Easy peasy. He can handle anything this game throws at him. And this game throws a lot of very different stuff at players. So different, in fact, that Resident Evil 8's several acts end up feeling more like individual games onto themselves. The Resident Evil franchise has never been afraid to change up its MO halfway through a game, but RE8 has shifts that are so jarring between elements that are so disparate and detached that the game itself feels like it's going through some kind of identity crisis. Early on in Resident Evil 8's campaign, there's a moment in which Ethan is captured by the inhabitants of the eponymous village and dragged before a group of conspicuously flamboyant characters. The Resident Evil series has had its share of memorable antagonists over the years, but from the moment I laid eyes on these guys, it was clear that they had far more personality and characterization than your average RE baddies. Their pre-existing relationships and the precise feelings that each shared for the others were apparent. But what was fascinating was how utterly different they all were from one another. Yeah, sure, Lisa Trevor has little in common with Albert Wesker, and the enthralled Jill Valentine is a far cry from whatever the hell this thing is. But these guys felt like they all hailed from different worlds altogether, or at the very least, different genres. That brief scene was still going around my head by the time I made it past the game's first major hurdle, which rewarded me with a key with a winged motif. Right after that moment, players discover an area with an altar and several doors with a similar winged design. The Duke, Resident Evil 8's version of what are you buying, then explains that Ethan must hunt and destroy the remaining lords in order to retrieve the rest of the MacGuffins that he needs. And that's when it hit me. Was Resident Evil changing the formula? Was the series branching out by changing its structure to resemble something like Mega Man? Was I going to be able to choose the order in which I tackled these lords? I thought this was finally it. I thought Resident Evil was finally experimenting with a more open, interconnected game world. Something resembling a Metroidvania, for lack of a better term here. After all, they just set up the premise of separate bosses to beat, each with their own territory on a map, which was, much to my delight, continuing to open up. The village area that I passed through in the very beginning of my playthrough was now available to me again with more avenues to explore, items to collect, and rooms to clear out. And after doing so, I was ready to make my choice between the two winged doors back at the altar. I happened to choose the door that led to the impressively eerie Valley of the Dolls. Fast forward to the end of my time in that region, and I acquired an item that took me by surprise. It was a piece that upgraded the wing key, allowing it to unlock more doors, specifically the other wing door by the altar, which meant that I was never able to unlock it. I never had a choice. I just happened to choose the one path that this game was designed to funnel me down the whole time. Despite how it seemed, and the clear opportunities to create a unique survival horror experience in which players are tasked with gradually exploring one big region, Resident Evil 8, much to my disappointment, opted for the old reliable RE formula. No going back, only forward, with less and less dread, challenges, and choices as you progress. I promise you, that I didn't go into this game or this video looking to once again make a public outcry about how Resident Evil should move in the direction of Metroidvanias. But it's hard to ignore how Resident Evil 8 tees itself up in several ways to create the most open, explorable, interconnected, and straight up enjoyable entry in the series and then just settles into old patterns. RE8 may have some of the best individual elements in the entire franchise, but their impact is severely blunted by how disjointed those elements in the game itself are. Firstly, there's the tone, or rather, 
tones. And boy, does this game cycle through a lot of them. But Resident Evil 8's spookiest stuff is pretty front-loaded, and it's what left me the most impressed during my first leisurely trip through the campaign. So yeah, my very first step on the road to completion was just simply beating the game, not worrying about any other completion criteria, and just immersing myself in everything that RE8 had to offer. And I'm glad I did because, as I said, the horror is on point. I can see why Capcom chose Castle Dimitrescu as the setting for Resident Evil 8's demo. It's impressive and immediately arrests the player's attention with its gothic architecture and mostly empty corridors. I love this place and I love how genuinely ominous it is. Flickering candlelight, the echoes of distant footsteps, the dark and spooky castle has been a staple of horror for good reason and it makes RE8's first act the front runner for the best in the game. But the very next area, the aforementioned Valley of the Dolls, truly gives Castle Dimitrescu a run for its money. This small, unassuming cottage is still bringing horror to the table, but it's a different kind of horror altogether. Herein lie the senses of terror and helplessness that I look for in a horror game. This relatively modest locale contains some of the absolute best moments of dread and psychological terror in this game, perhaps in the entire series. Whereas the castle was all about clearly defined, classic threats, this place deals in unseen and uncanny disturbances that may not even be real. But of course, it wouldn't be a Resident Evil if the adrenaline didn't get turned up about halfway through. Soon after leaving the dollhouse, players will, once again, traipse around in broad daylight before participating in a frantic chase sequence, and then stepping into what can only be described as a steampunk killbot factory. It's at this point that the game begins to prioritize thrills over everything else, which, again, is par for the course when it comes to this franchise. But that twinge of disappointment that's usually felt when you realize that the scary part of the game is over hurts all the more in Resident Evil 8 because the game's very layout lends itself to a less linear, more interwoven structure. If we're constantly being asked to return to the village and explore more recently unlocked areas within, why couldn't we have done the same with Castle Dimitrescu or the Dollhouse? If we can return to a previous location, why not a previous tone? But alas, it wasn't meant to be. Once you leave one of the realms of the Four Lords, you'll never return, no matter how much you really want to. Now, I understand the usefulness of gating the player at critical junctions, strategically cutting them off so they can be led where they're intended to go, but the structure of the village makes the notion of returning to your favorite spots so damn tantalizing. They're right freaking there, just down these trails, but forever locked away, leading players inevitably down the path of tonal entropy and inadvertently making each of the game's main areas feel like they exist in different worlds instead of this one village that they all border. But the most jarring tonal shifts occur when Resident Evil 8 attempts to make players feel things. Not like afraid or excited, but whenever the game tries to make the player empathize with Ethan. It may be true that the series has tried to pluck at players' heartstrings in the past, but the attempts at pathos have never been given so much screen time here, so much dedicated attention. And I'd be all for this decision if the game actually succeeded in making me care. Now, it's easy to relate to the idea of trying to save a loved one who's out of reach, which is why there are so many, many stories that share that exact same premise. But if Resident Evil 8 is going to feature so many moments that hinge on how Ethan or any of its characters feel during these extraordinary circumstances, it would be nice if the game actually established what these people want and how they feel about each other early on. We spend virtually no time getting to know who Ethan is nowadays before shit hits the fan. The guy barely mentions or reacts to his wife who was mowed down in front of him hours ago. He walks around slinging quips at Eastern European masters of magnetism. And this game expects me to feel actual emotions when he's trying to reach his daughter? Ethan Winters isn't a real person. 
he's just as much a cartoon as Albert Wesker. The difference is that Wesker's games didn't feature multiple scenes that hinge on me feeling anything deeper than being creeped out. RE8 isn't really concerned with laying the foundations necessary for its attempts at poignancy to succeed. Instead, it spends its time furthering the mystery of Chris Redfield's motivations for very little payoff, explaining why Ethan can do the seemingly miraculous things he can do, which is totally unnecessary, and drawing ineffective connections between this series' past and its present. Chris could have been cut entirely from this game, and Resident Evil 8 would have been better for it. He adds nothing but an impotent sense of mystery and a protracted action sequence towards the climax. Utterly disappointing here. And as far as Ethan goes, the revelations about him confirm that the people behind RE8 don't know the difference between revealing new, obviously retconned information about a character and actually developing that character. And as much as I like that this game hints at the ties between longtime antagonists, the Umbrella Corporation, and the goings on in this village, those ties could have had far more impact if they weren't relegated to a single isolated note. Look, the way that Resident Evil 8 handles tone isn't terrible, but it is glaring compared to the more gradual shifts towards action in previous titles. When you're constantly reminded of the wonderful horror that you can never go back to, and when the game continually halts the momentum to stumble through what should be a touching moment, the whole experience comes off as uncoordinated. And unfortunately, seeing as how Resident Evil games' tones are often reflected by their mechanics, Resident Evil 8's gameplay as a whole also seems muddled. First and foremost, this game is a shooter. But of course, depending on how deep into the campaign you are, the exact type of first-person gaming will vary. For example, while there is combat within the halls of Castle de Matresque, the encounters are relatively sparse and deliberate. But what truly separates this area's gameplay from the others is that it requires the most backtracking and crisscrossing in order to gradually open up all that it hides, with the ladies of the manor stalking you throughout. This whole area acts as a small-scale version of what I wish this entire game turned out to be, and it's brilliant. And then, in the next area, there's a dramatic shift in gameplay. All of a sudden, Ethan Winters gets Metroided. All of his guns are taken away, and he's locked in a comparatively simple location that doesn't hide that many secrets. It's one big escape room with a heavy emphasis on puzzle solving. No combat, but plenty of danger and intrigue. At first, I was thrown off but this area turned out to be one of my favorites. And not just because it was satisfyingly eerie, but because its very different gameplay was just as enjoyable, if not more so, than the previous area. How come this can't be the whole game, I wonder? And there's the rub! While REA possesses plenty of these wonderful elements, those elements are too divorced from one another. There's no reason why the stellar gameplay in the castle has to end so that the equally captivating puzzle mechanics can begin. Resident Evil 8 unnecessarily quarantines its good ideas from one another, missing the opportunity to create an endlessly engrossing and rewarding experience. It's kind of a bummer that Resident Evil 8 makes you put away the cool toys you play with in one zone forever in order to enjoy your other toys especially when you realize that mixing things up would have been a surefire way to improve the not-so-impressive sections. Running from a sea monster and then fighting in a giant arena is cool and all, but it would have been wonderful if you had to do some quick hiding in the middle of it. Throwing down with steampunk Cenobites is tight, but it would have been leagues better if you also had to avoid Heisenberg at the same time as he personally hunts you down in his own factory, Mr. X style. This was especially noticeable during the next step of the completion process, which was beating the campaign several more times. After finishing the campaign for the first time, Resident Evil 8 opens wide up, revealing bonuses that need to be unlocked, in-game challenges which require satisfying, and a new game plus system that lets you take all of your acquired weapons and upgrades with you into a brand new campaign. This obviously goes a long way in helping players complete certain campaign challenges, like the no spending money, no organizing the inventory, no healing knife only speedrun that I did for my second playthrough. In my efforts to knock out as many of those little campaign challenges as possible, as quickly as possible, I inadvertently created an experience 
that was far different than my first time through. But I couldn't help but wish that that was even more different. There's only so much the same campaign can be changed by those stipulations. What I craved was a campaign that was more flexible to begin with, with a more open economical approach to its design. As much as these campaign challenges have the potential to add some much needed spice to the more forgettable portions of the campaign, they're simply not enough. I'm sure I've said it before, but a key element in horror is the unknown. And if you know where all the scares are coming from, then that can make for some boring replays. I wish Resident Evil 8's hardest mode would have at least changed around even more of its elements, like item locations and solutions to the puzzles. That would have made my third collect everything and blow everyone away with my unstoppable super gun playthrough that much more enjoyable. In essence, I wish that this campaign had the depth to make multiple playthroughs compelling, and I wish that my sense of progression were tied to the actual feats I was accomplishing. I also wish that instead of seeing some new weapons occasionally pop up at the Duke's shop, that I acquired new gear from defeating bosses. How cool would it would have been to discover a powerful stylized pistol deep within Castle Dimitrescu after taking down the last of its inhabitants? Or what about acquiring some sort of aesthetic ammunition for defeating the bulbous Moreau? Instead of making the things I do feel like they matter, it just feels like Ethan gets stronger over time naturally without my input. I never had to worry about inventory space, ever. I was halfway through the game when I realized that I never needed to make a hard decision about what to take with me and what to pitch. Yes, it could be argued that that was because I made sure to buy the bigger item cases when they showed up at the Dukes, but you'd think that in this game, which exists in a series where inventory management was traditionally a big deal, that I'd eventually have to think about my gear, think about my choices, but no, never. In fact, every type of item has its own page in the menu now, so your keys and your crafting materials are completely separate from your main items completely eradicating the need to ever wonder if you should pick something up. It's just automatic. And that's the way that progression itself feels in Resident Evil 8, on autopilot. I don't have to think about what I'm taking with me because the game makes it overly obvious which options are better than the others. I don't have to think about which ways to go during my subsequent playthroughs because there's only one way to really go, forward. When completing Resident Evil 8, you'll probably get to a point where you'll mindlessly just be plowing forward, grinding out those final challenges, just like I did. And that's a shame, not because the inevitable tedious grinding of challenges is that atrocious, but because there's something to be said about going backwards, especially in what's touted as a horror experience. Wondering, what's changed since the last time I've been here? Have I missed something? Where do I go next? Am I making the right decisions? Ironically enough, Resident Evil 8 does have one feature that forces players to ask those questions. It's just probably not where you'd expect. It sounds weird, but while I completed RE8, most of my critical thinking and challenge came from Mercenaries mode, the final leg of the completion journey. What's traditionally thought of as the run and gun, turn your brain off palate cleanser, actually turned out to be Resident Evil 8's greatest source of fulfillment and thrills. Tonally, it couldn't be more different from the campaign. There is no immersion to be had here in this purely arcade style experience, with its time limits, power-ups, life bars, and damage numbers. It's all about racking up a high score by continually adding to your kill combo, picking up bonus loot, and banking those numbers in the hopes of achieving a high ranking. For us completionists, earning the coveted S rankings on all eight mercenary stages isn't quite enough. Not even double S is good enough, thanks to the existence of the ridiculous triple S ranking. Why do we have to obtain this ranking? Because that's what it means to be a completionist. If it exists, it has to be obtained. At least when it's right there taunting me, it does. And the only way to get that triple S ranking on a stage is to achieve a perfect combo. That means never breaking your combo once across each round of any given stage. There's absolutely no way to luck yourself into a perfect combo. It's only possible with comprehensive knowledge of the stage's enemy placements, power-up spawn points, and the best route between all of those things and your ultimate goal. It takes a lot of time and dedication to figure out which guns to prioritize, which time bonuses and power-ups to rush down slash ignore, 
and which enemies to leave with a sliver of health so you can then kite them towards the next checkpoint, allowing you to preserve your endless combo. The only thing that even compares to this amount of cognitive and manual work is the speedrun challenge, but Mercenaries mode eclipses that by several times. What we're describing here is several hours work. So many hours that, combined with how different this alternative mode feels from the campaign, that mercenary mode ends up feeling like its own separate game. This mode is, without a doubt, the most challenging and time-consuming part of the completion process. But what surprised me is that it might be the most satisfying as well. It may have been a pain to obtain all those triple S rankings, but it was more rewarding than grinding out challenges in the campaign playthroughs. Mercenaries may not have as much atmosphere or narrative as the campaign, but its tonal identity seems laser focused compared to the rest of the game. Ultimately, Mercenaries mode reminds me of yet another direction the campaign could have gone. Instead of attempting to do it all, the campaign could have only focused on its strongest aspects, the early game horror and interconnected gameplay design, which would leave all the adrenaline and linear action in Mercenaries a place where it's utilized much more deftly. But of course, the Metroidvania route would have worked great as well. After all, one of the best ways to make your game mechanics feel good is to give them depth and ensure that they remain relevant. By reinforcing and reincorporating its strongest elements, perhaps by designing a campaign that requires players to slowly open up a massive area by returning to previously visited locations with new abilities and items, Resident Evil 8 could have blown me away. But as it stands now, it's merely serviceable, a satisfactory chapter in the Resident Evil saga that I'll personally remember most for what it easily could have been. When it comes to completing Resident Evil Village, it borrows a lot of the same mechanics that we kind of saw from Resident Evil 3 Remake. You kind of know the deal. All the challenges that you unlock or progress through in multiple playthroughs of the game. Resident Evil is no stranger to completionists and what is required for you to go on that completionist journey. In Resident Evil 8, this is one of the most easy journeys that you'll have to experience and I'm grateful for the ease that came from completing this game, but the small dopamine hits of unlocking all the little figurines and character models isn't quite as impactful as I thought it would be. Resident Evil 8 is a fine game, but I can't help but express my disappointment at some of its missed opportunities. While it possesses some of the best moments I've ever seen in an RE title, and the way that it handles completion is organized and self-contained, I wish that it let the pendulum swing more toward interconnectedness, not just for the sake of this game, but to signify an exciting future for the whole franchise. Now the rewards that you ultimately get for completing it aren't that exciting, but there's plenty to love about that very first trip through Resident Evil Village's campaign. So. With that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it!